Hi, welcome to Goodnight Flagstaff. I'm Jamie Paul, um, a local teacher, writer, and reading lover. And this summer I'm working with kids at Montessori Forest Adventures Forest Camp. Um, first day camp, and we have different kids who are reading parts of the Goodnight Flagstaff books to you every week. Um, today we have Xavier Toonbird, who is going to read for you the first part of the chapter for tonight, which is chapter 15. Um, we usually run out of time because we're playing in the forest a lot, so sometimes then I read the rest of it. But today we start with Xavier. You can find a new chapter from one of our favorite family-friendly books at 8 p.m. each weeknight on the Literacy Center's YouTube channel and on Crater Radio, which is a local online radio station. The previous chapter is replayed on Crater Radio each weeknight at about 7.45, just before the new chapter airs. You can also listen to all previous Goodnight Flagstaff recordings on YouTube. We are reading The Chronicles of Narnia by C.S. Lewis, Book 6, The Silver Chair. If you'd like to check out any of Narnia books to read along with us at home, they are all available in the Hoopla app with your Coconino County Library card. Check out one today! You could email us if you'd like to join our team of readers and connect with the community through stories. All ages are welcome. Our email is goodnightflagstaff at gmail.com. The last time we read together, we learned that the Earthman, named Golg, is actually genuinely thrilled the queen has been cut down. He and his people, the gnomes from a land even deeper than the underworld, have been enslaved by the queen's enchantment. Rillian was tempted by Golg's offer to show him the deeper land of the world, where gems grow wildly. Instead, the adventurous prince and the rest of the party began the climb to the surface. And now, go! Hi, I'm Xavier Toonbird. I, I go to Secrets Elementary and I'm in second grade. Nice. The patch of light did not show up anything down in the darkness where they were standing. The others could only hear, not see Jill's effort. Yeah, efforts. Efforts to get on the to the marsh wiggles back. That is, they heard him saying, "You needn't uh-huh. put your back." Your finger? No, hold on. Your right on back. Here, your finger. Oh, your finger in my eye, and nor uh-huh. nor your foot in my mouth. Either, and that's more like it. Now, and now I'll hold on to your legs. That'll leave your arms free to steady yourself against the earth. Then they looked up, and soon they saw the black shape of Jill's head against the patch of light. Well, they all shouted up. Anxiously. Anxiously. It's a hole called Jill's voice. I could get through it if I was a little bit higher. What do you see through it? asked Eustace. Eustace. Nothing much yet, said Jill. I say puddle pud- glum. Puddle glum let go my legs. Yep. So I that I can stand on your shoulders instead of sitting on them. I can steady myself all right. Against the edge, they could hear her moving, and then much more of her came to into sight. Against the grayness of the opening, in fact, all her, all of her down to the waist, I say, begin Jill, but suddenly broke with a cry. Not a sharp cry, it sounded more as if her mouth had been muffled up or had something pushed into it. Uh-huh. Or after that, she found her voice and seemed to be shouting out as loud as she could 
but they couldn't hear the words. Two things then happened. At the same moment, the patch of light was completely blocked up for a second or so, and they heard both a scuff. Scuffling. scuffling, struggling sound, and the voice of the marsh wiggle, yes. gasping, quick, help, hold on to her legs. Someone's pulling her there. No, here too late. The opening in the cold light which filled it where... Now perfectly clear again. Jill had vanished. Jill, Jill! They shouted frantically, but there was no answer. Why did the why the Dickens? The, why the Dickens couldn't you have held her feet? Said Eustace. Eustace, I don't know. Scrub groaned. Puddle Glum, born to he be a misfit. I shouldn't wonder, fated, fated to be the pole's death. Just as I was fated to eat talking shradge as her. Harfang. <laughs> it's a name. It's Harfang. Not to that it isn't my own fault as well, of course. This is the greatest shame and sorrow that uh, that could be have fallen on us, said the prince. We have sent a brave lady into the hands of enemies and stayed behind in safety. Don't paint it too black, sir, said Puddle Glam. We're not very <laughs> safe except for death by starvation in this hole. I wonder, am I small enough to get through where Jill did, said Houston. What had really happened to Jill? Was this as soon as she got her her head out of the hole she found that she was looking through down as if she from up in upstairs window not up as if through a trap door she had been so long in the dark that her eyes couldn't at first take in what the sunny world which she so wanted to see the air seemed to be deadly cold, and the light was pale and blue. There was also a good deal of noise and coming. No, wait, light uh, was pale and blue. There was also a good deal of noise going on, and a lot of white objects flying about in the air. It was at that moment that she had shouted down to Puddle Glum to let her stand up on this his shoulders when she had done this she could see and hear a good deal better the noises she had been hearing turned out to be of two kinds the rhythmical rhythmical, rhythmical thump of several feet and uh, the music of four fiddles, three fluts, and a drum. She also got her own position clear. She was looking out of a hole in a steep bank, which sloped down and reached the level about 14 feet below her. Everything was very white. A lot of people were moving about. Then she gasped. The people were trim little fawns and dry ads uh -huh. with leaf crowned, yeah. hair floating behind them. For a second, they looked 
as if they were moving. Anyhow, she she saw that they were really doing a dance. They dance with so many complete. Complicated, complicated steps and figures that that it took you some time to understand it. Then it came over her like a thunderclap. That the pale blue light was really moonlight, and the white stuff on the ground was really snow. And of course, there were the stairs, stars. stars staring in a black frosty sky overhead, and the tall black things behind the dancers were trees. They had not only got into out into the upper world, world at last, but had come.、Uh -huh. Out in the the heart of Narnia, 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 Jill felt she could have fainted with delight, and the music, the wild music, instantly sweet and yet just a the, the least bit eerie too, and full of good magic, as the witch's thrumming had been. Full of bad magic made her feel it the more. Okay, let's stop because that was a. All this takes a long time to tell, but of course it took a very short time to see. Jill turned almost at once to shout down to the others. I say it's all right. We're out and we're home. But the reason she never got further than I say was this: circling round and round the dancers was a ring of dwarfs, all dressed in their finest clothes. Mostly scarlet, with a fur-lined hoods and golden tassels and big furry top boots. As they circled round, they were all diligently throwing snowballs. Those were the white things that Jill had seen flying through the air. They weren't throwing them at the dancers as silly boys might have been doing in England. They were throwing them through the dance in such a perfect time with the music and with such perfect aim that if all the dancers were in exactly the right places at exactly the right moments, no one would be hit. This is called the Great Snow Dance, and it is done every year in Narnia on the first moonlit night when there is snow on the ground. Of course, it is kind of a game as well as a dance because every now and then, some dancer will be the least little bit wrong and get a snowball in the face, and then everyone laughs. But a good team of dancers, dwarfs, and musicians will keep it up for hours without a single hit. On fine nights, when the cold and drum taps. And the drum taps and the hooting of the owls and the moonlight have got into their wild woodland blood and made it even wilder. They will all dance till daybreak. I wish you could see it for yourselves. What had stopped Jill when she got as far as the say of I say was, of course, simply a fine big snowball that came sailing through the dance from a dwarf on the far side and got her fair and square in the mouth. She didn't in the least mind. Twenty snowballs would not have dampened her spirits at that moment. But however happy you are feeling, you can't talk with your mouth full of snow. And when, after considerable spluttering, she could speak again, she quite forgot in her excitement that the others down in the dark behind her still didn't know the good news. She simply leaned as far out of the hole as she could and yelled to the dancers, "Help! Help! We're buried in the hill. Come and dig us out!" The Narnians, who had not even noticed the little hole in the hillside, were of course very surprised and looked about in several wrong directions before they found out where the voice was coming from. But when they caught sight of Jill, they all came running towards her, and as and as many as could scrambled up the bank, and a dozen or more hands were stretched out to help her. And Jill caught hold of them and thus got out of the hole and came slithering. Down the bank head first, and then picked herself up and said, "Oh, do go and dig the others out. There are three others besides the horses, and one of them is Prince Rillian." She was already in the middle of a crowd when she said this, for besides the dancers, all sorts of people who had been watching the dancers and whom she had not seen at first came running up. Squirrels came out of the trees in showers, and so did owls. Hedgehogs came waddling as fast as their short legs could carry them. Bears and badgers followed at a slower pace. A great panther, twitching its tail in excitement, was the last to join the party. 
But as soon as they understood what Joe was saying, they all became active. Pick and shovel, boys, pick and shovel, off for our tools, said the dwarfs, and dashed away into the woods at top speed. Wake up some moles, they're in the chaps for digging. They're quite as good as dwarfs, said a voice. What was that she said about Prince Rillian? said another. Hush, said the panther. The poor child's crazed, and no wonder at being lost inside the hill. She doesn't know what she's saying. That's right, said an old bear. Why, she said Prince Rillian was a horse. No, she didn't, said a squirrel, very pert. Yes, she did, said another squirrel, even perter. It's quite it's true. Don't be silly, said Jill. She spoke like that because her teeth were now chattering with the cold. Immediately, one of the dryads flung around her a furry cloak, which some dwarf had dropped when he rushed to fetch his mining tools, and an obliging fawn trotted off among the trees to a place where Jill could see firelight in the mouth of a cave to get her a hot drink. But before it came, all the dwarfs reappeared with spades and pickaxes and charged at the hillside. Then Jill heard cries of, Hi, what are you doing? Put that sword down! And, Now, young'un, none of that! And, He's a vicious one now, isn't he? Jill hurried to the spot and didn't know whether to laugh or cry when she saw Eustace's face, very pale and dirty, projecting from the blackness of the hole, and Eustace's right hand brandishing a sword with which he made lunges at anyone who came near him. For, of course, Eustace had been having a very different time from Jill during the last few minutes. He had heard Jill cry out and seen her disappear into the unknown. Like the prince and Pelaglum, he thought that some enemies had caught her, and from down below he didn't see that the pale bluish light was moonlight. He thought the hole would lead only into some other cave lit by some ghostly phosphorescence and filled with goodness knows what evil creatures of the underworld, so that when he had a persuaded Pondoglum to give him a back and draw his sword and poked his head out, he had really been doing a very brave thing. The others would have done it first if they could, but the hole was too small for them to climb through. Eustace was a little bigger and a lot clumsier than Jill, so that when he looked out, he bumped his head against the top of the hole and brought a small avalanche of snow down on his face. And so, when he could see again and saw dozens of figures coming at him as hard as they could run, it is not surprising that he tried to ward them off. Stop, Eustace, stop, cried Jill. They're all friends, can't you see? We've come up in Narnia. Everything's all right. Then Eustace did see and apologized to the dwarfs, and the dwarfs said not to mention it, and dozens of thick, hairy, dwarfish hands helped him out just as they had helped Jill out a few minutes before. Then Jill scrambled up the bank and put her head in at a dark opening and shouted the good news in to the prisoners. As she turned away, she heard Puddleglum mutter, Ah, poor Pole, it's been too much for her, this last bit. Turning her head, I shouldn't wonder. She's beginning to see things. Jill rejoined Eustace, and they shook one another by both hands and took in great deep breaths of the free midnight air, and a warm cloak was brought for Eustace and hot drinks for both. While they were sipping it, the dwarves had already got all the snow and all the sods off a large strip of hillside round the original hole, and the pickaxes and spades were now going as merrily as the feet of fines and dryads had been going in the dance ten minutes before. Only ten minutes, yet already it felt to Jill and Eustace as if all their dangers in the dark and heat and general smotheriness of the earth must have been only a dream. Out here in the cold with the moon and the huge stars overhead, Narnian stars are nearer than stars in our world, and with kind merry faces all around them, one couldn't quite believe in Underland. Before they had finished their hot drinks, a dozen or so moles, newly waked and still very sleepy, and not well pleased, had arrived. But as soon as they understood what it was all about, they joined in with a will. Even the fawns made themselves useful by carting away the earth in little barrows, and the squirrels danced and leaped to and fro in great excitement, though Jill never found out exactly what they thought they were doing. The bears and owls contented themselves with giving advice, and kept on asking the children if they wouldn't like to come into the cave, that was where Jill had seen the firelight, and get warm and have supper, but the children couldn't bear to go without seeing their friends set free. No one in our world can work at a job of that sort as dwarfs and talking moles work in Narnia. But then, of course, moles and dwarfs don't look on, look on it as work. They like digging. It was therefore not really long before they had opened a great black chasm in the hillside, and out from the blackness into the moonlight, this would have been rather dreadful if one hadn't known who they were, came first the long, leggy, steeple-hatted figure of the marsh wiggle, and then leading to... Two great horses, Rillian, the prince himself. 
As Puddle Glum appeared, shouts broke out on every side. Why, it's a wiggle. Why, it's old Puddle Glum, old Puddle Glum from Easter Marshes. Whatever have you been doing, Puddle Glum? They've been search parties out for you, and the Lord Tumpkin has been putting up notices. There's a reward offered. But all this died away, all in one moment, into dead silence, as quickly as the noise dies away in a rowdy dormitory if the headmaster opens the door. For now, they saw the prince. No one doubted for a moment who he was. There was plenty of beasts and dryads and dwarfs and fawns who remembered him from the days before his enchanting. There were some old ones who could just remember how his father, King Caspian, had looked when he was a young man and saw the likeness. But I think they would have known him anyway, pale though he was from long imprisonment in the dark glands, dressed in black, dusty, disheveled, and weary. There was something in his face and air which no one could mistake. That look as in the face of all true kings of Narnia, who rule by the will of Aslan and sit at Caraparavel on the throne of Peter the High King. Instantly, every head was bared and every knee was bent. A moment later, such cheering and shouting, such jumps and reels of joy, such handshaking and kissing and embracing of everybody by everybody else broke out that the tears came into Jill's eyes. Their quest had been worth all the pains it cost. Please, it your highness, said the oldest of the dwarves. There is some attempt at a supper in the cave yonder, prepared against the ending of the snow dance. With a good will, father, said the prince, for never had any prince, knight, gentleman, or bear so good a stomach to his victuals as we four wonders have tonight. The whole crowd began to move away through the trees towards the cave. Jill heard Puddleglum say to those who pressed around him, No, no, my story can wait. Nothing worth talking about has happened to me. I want to hear the news. Don't try breaking it to me gently, for I'd rather have it all at once. Has the king been shipwrecked? Any forest fires? No wars on the Collarman border? Or a few dragons, I shouldn't wonder? And all the creatures laughed aloud and said, Isn't that just like a marsh wiggle? The two children were nearly dropping with tiredness and hunger, but the warmth of the cave and the very sight of it, with the firelight dancing on the walls and dressers and cups and saucers and plates and on the smooth stone floor, just as it does in a farmhouse kitchen, revived them a little. All the same, they went fast asleep while supper was being got ready. And while they slept, Prince Rillian was talking over the whole adventure with the older and wiser beasts and dwarves. And now they all saw what it meant, how a wicked witch, doubtless the same kind as that white witch who had bought the great winter on Narnia long ago, had contrived the whole thing, first killing Rillian's mother and enchanting Rillian himself. And they saw how she had dug right under Narnia and was going to break out and rule it through Rillian, and how he had never dreamed that the country of which she would make him king, king in name but really her slave, was his own country. And from the children's part of the story they saw how she was in league and friendship with the dangerous giant of Harfang. And the lesson of it all is, your highness, said the oldest dwarf, that those northern witches almost me- always mean the same thing. But in every age, they have a different plan for getting it. Join us tomorrow for chapter 16, The Healing of Harms, which is the last chapter in The Silver Chair. And then we'll be moving on to The Last Battle, the last Narnia book, before we go to Race to the Sun by Rebecca Roanhorse. Um, thank you for joining us, and good night, Flagstaff.